sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we testify with firmness that none is worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his worshipping slave and final messenger ahibbati fillah I remind myself and you of the important ayah in surah al Imran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invites us and commands us by saying ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu o you who have come to believe O you who have accepted faith, ittaqullah. Be mindful, be aware, be conscious of your dealings with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Haqqa tuqatih. In the measure and to the capacity that he is deserving of you. Wala tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. And do not depart from this worldly life in any condition or state other than willful, voluntary submission to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. With the barakah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the month of Rabi'ah al-awwal has arrived, alhamdulillah. Those of us who were looking up in the sky yesterday, not for fireworks, but for other things, you could see a big moon uh, was alhamdulillah surrounding the city. And traditionally, within Islamic societies, there has been the custom and the habit of establishing the month of Rabi'ah al-awwal as being linked and associated with the birth of Al-Mustafa, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is even though there is no authentic hadith that mentions the correct day or time or date. The only hadith we know is the hadith in Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, either Monday or Thursday, either one, either on a Monday or a Thursday, I was born. And that is one of the reasons we fast. We make our siyam as part of the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. It's one of the reasons he fasts on that Monday and in other narrations on that Thursday, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But when you look in the books of Sirah, you see that the scholars, many of them have more than 27 different opinions as to when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born. And this isn't something strange. In fact, my grandmother... May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give her good health in Canada. I was visiting her a few days ago. In Canada, a few weeks ago. We don't really know when she was born. And this is common for many societies, Islamic societies. You kind of know the year. Maybe it was, to, you know, 1902. Maybe it was 1905. Allahu alam. Definitely you don't know the month. And one of the things that you find even with many of the people, in, in, even in Perth, working at an Islamic school and within the Islamic school system, you see a lot of people born January 1st or May 1st, May 2nd, you know. Uh, the reason that government, when they assign a date, they choose the beginning of the month. You tell them, look, I think my son was born May 1996, 97. They say, okay, May 1st, 1999. So how is it that we can consider that at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they didn't keep these things as being something of importance. What we do know is he was born either the year 570 or 571 after the, uh, the common era or the era that is claimed as the birth of Isa alayhi salam, which means 1441 or 40 years ago, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered into this world. The day and time is not important, and therefore the Islamic calendar doesn't begin with his birth, and doesn't begin with his message. But it's a day, and it's an occasion, and it's a month that Muslims, alhamdulillah, have come to assume the mention of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And traditional scholars of Islam have not seen this as being sinful without establishing, you know, certain practices that are associated with that day. So let us talk about Khayrul Khay. Let us talk about the best of humanity, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The thing about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, my dear brothers and sisters, is that in any circumstance in your life, you can find an example in his life. Whether it is with your children, whether it is at work, whether it is in moments of joy, whether it's in moments of sadness, whether it's in moments of prosperity, wealth, whether it's in moments of poverty and poorness, the Prophet wasallam, Allah in those years of his risala, those 23 years of message, filled his life wasallam, with examples for us. 
I was giving a, a seminar over in the United Kingdom just last weekend. And one of the brothers, you know, he came up and he said, look, listen, brother, I'm having some family trouble. My wife and I, we don't get along. And I said, ya akhi, listen, even Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad, the best of humanity sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were moments of tension in his life. He said, brother Yahya, come on. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was married to Aisha radiallahu anha. I told him Aisha was married to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Your wife isn't married to Muhammad, just like you're not married to Aisha. He said, Ya Rasulullah, no, no, that was a long time ago. That was a different line. I said, what makes him so different? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He goes, no, you can't show me an example. I said, let me show you an example from the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Our Prophet, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, married a woman who was from a Jewish ancestry. His wife, her initial religion, Jewish. Another one of his wife, Christian. Mariya al-Qudsiyya wa Safiya bint Huyayn, radiyallahu anhun. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, different cultures, different language, different culture, different language. The Prophet ﷺ married a woman who was married before him with children and another woman married before him without children. He married a woman who was Aisha radiallahu anha, the only one who was not married before him ﷺ, who was very young compared to him. The Prophet ﷺ married women from outside his tribe, far from Quraysh, far from the people of his language and his ancestry. He married ﷺ in all cultures, all examples, all situations of marital construct, you find an example in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And therefore we come to know the secret of why Muhammad sallallahu was sent to us as human beings as rahmah lil alameen. I want you to understand this word when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa ma arsalnaq, it's nafi and is bad. We did not, Allah yamsi, Allah saying, there's no other reason. Or this in balagha means this is the most important reason we have sent you, O Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is it? Rahmah. A mercy lil alameen to everything that exists. Now when you hear this word rahmah, you have to associate it with the greatest name. That is a sifa an attribute of Allah. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about himself, the first ta'rif, the first opportunity in Surah Al-Fatiha, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, who is he? Ar-Rahman. The one who gives mercy. And what is the mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to you and I? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. In the authentic hadith narrated by Imam Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala for Allah, there is a hundred sections of mercy, one hundred different levels of rahmah. And if all the mercy of all the blessing of all the rahmah Allah has given to this earth, He sent only one of the one hundred sections and kept with Him, sallallahu subhanahu wa ta'ala, kept with Him ninety nine equal sections of mercy. And the Prophet ﷺ says, never does a mother love her son, never does a mother love her child, never do two people come together in happiness, except all of this happiness we have in the world is one of the mercies of Allah. And they said to him, Ya Rasulullah, what about the other 99? And the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ says, those 99 are kept for you on the day of judgment. And in mercy, in Jannah al firdaus The scholars such as Imam al-Nawawi, in explaining this hadith, he says to us, the one who is going to facilitate this mercy of Allah is the shafa'ah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On the day when everything seems to collapse, on the day you come out of your grave, my dear brother, my dear sister in al-Islam, and you look to your right and you look to your left and la tara illa ظلام. You see the darkness. And you look to yourself and you are nude and you are exposed. And some people on that day of judgment, ya ibad Allah, they will come in disfigured shapes. 
Some of them will come carrying property on their shoulders. They are the ones who used to steal from others. Others on the Day of Judgment, the Prophet ﷺ said, will come out of their grave. Their whole body, Salim, is whole except their face. They have no face. The flesh on their face is gone. They said, Ya Rasulullah, why is this? Because that man had wealth but would ask people for that which he did not need. He had no shame in how he approached people. On the Day of Judgment, the Mu'addin will have the longest neck. I don't mean like a giraffe. A long neck means you're standing straight and your chest is out and you're proud of your accomplishments. The Mu'addin, the caller to the people to prayer. On the Day of Judgment, there will be those who will come upon pillars of light. They're carried on light. They don't need to walk or move themselves. And the light carries them this nur that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides is for them to see and others to be blinded from. And not because you see in this dunya, ya aqi wa ya uqi in al-Islam, it means you will see in the akhirah. And Allah tells us in Surah Taha near its conclusion that there will be people who will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in the dunya, ya Allah, we used to see and we used to hear and we used to speak. كَذَلِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتُنَا But Allah responds on the day of judgment when, you're, when our signs used to come to you in the dunya, when our verses in the sunnah of the Prophet would arrive to you, you were blind to them, you turned away. When you heard of the truth, you pretended you couldn't hear. When you had an opportunity to speak a word of righteousness, you silenced yourself. كَذَلِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتُنَا فَنَفِيتَهَا وَكَذَلِكَ الْيَوْمَ تُنْسَى And today you find yourself in this condition where you have been forgotten and lost. And in that moment, everyone will search for someone يَشْفَعُ لَهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ People will come to Adam alayhi salam and they will say, Ya Adam, as is in the hadith of Abi Sa'id in Sahih al-Bukhari, Ya Adam, أنت أبو الناس, you are the master and the father of humanity. اشفع لنا عند ربك. Ask Allah to show us mercy. And Adam will say, no. Go to someone else. اذهبوا إلى غيري. I ate from the forbidden tree. I fear for myself. So they will come to Nuh. And they will say, ask Allah for our safety and salvation. And Nuh will say, no. Go to someone else. I made dua against my people. And they come to Ibrahim, and they say, Ya Ibrahim alayhi salam, ask Allah for us. And Ibrahim will say, Idhabu ila ghayri, go to someone else. فَقَدْ كَذَبْتُ ثَلَاثًا I lied in my life three times. The moment he told his people, I'm sick, you go to your party, I'm sick. And the second time, and the reason he wasn't sick, he wanted to destroy their idol. And the second lie was when they came back and they told him, who destroyed these idols? He said, it's the big one. Qala kabiruhum. Go, go ask this big idol. He lied to them again. And the third is when the king of Egypt was about to steal his wife. He lied and said, it's my sister. Hoping that he would live and she would live. Go to someone else. They come to Musa and Musa will say, Qataltu nafsan. I killed a man in my life. Idhabu ila ghayri. And they come to Isa alayhi salam. Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him. And he will not mention any sin. But he will say to them, Idhabu ila Muhammad. Go to the Prophet of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.